Last summer, I was asked to officiate a wedding that was being held at this cute little bed and breakfast on the eastern shore of Maryland. And if you've never stayed in a bed and breakfast, breakfast before, here's something that you absolutely need to know. You eat breakfast with the other guests who stayed the night there. Okay, the first time I went to a bed and breakfast, I didn't know this. We were actually in Frederick right down the road. We were visiting here, trying to figure out, is this where God wanted us to plant a church? And I totally thought it would be breakfast in bed. <laughs> nope, it's breakfast with strangers in a dining room. It kind of feels a lot like eating meals during the holidays with your extended family that you don't ever talk to. And so I know that some of you are extroverts and you think, this sounds incredible. It's not, okay? As an introvert, this is my death. It is slow and painful. Um, I don't even like breakfast. I'm a breakfast for dinner kind of guy. I don't want to eat breakfast in the morning. Um, and so knowing that we were going to a bed and breakfast, I was excited because my wife was coming with me. So that meant I didn't have to go alone. But then she got COVID. So I had to go alone. And so the morning of the wedding, breakfast was from 7 to 9 a.m. So I waited to like 8.58 to go to breakfast, hoping the dining room would be empty. It was completely full. There was only one seat available with a young couple that I'd met once in passing at Collective and then the previous night at the rehearsal dinner. So I was their third wheel. It was great. Uh, after a few awkward minutes of me acknowledging that I ruined this like really romantic morning breakfast overlooking the water, we started talking about life and careers. And because they knew mine, like they knew I was a pastor of Collective, they started asking me questions about this church. How did Collective get started? How did I get into ministry? Why is Collective so amazing? All questions that I like answering. But then it took a hard right turn when out of the blue they asked me, how do churches get money? I was like, that is not what you ask at breakfast. We're strangers. And I'm completely thrown off because to be honest, I had never been asked that question before. Right? No one has ever asked me that question before. In fact, I always assumed that people understood something when it comes to churches and money. But there I was talking to this couple uh, about giving and generosity and faith and how all of these things are intertwined. And it actually was an incredible conversation. Right? I knew that most of us have a very broken and jaded view of generosity and the church, right? I see that. I've heard that. You, many of you have told me that. But sitting down with them that morning, I learned that a lot of people don't actually know what God teaches about money. And so today we're kicking off this series called I Heart, and this is going to be a four-week series on giving and generosity. And I know that this is the one thing you don't want your pastor to talk about, and I get that. I actually recently read a study, it was a demographic report about Frederick, and one of the questions was for people who live in our community, why don't you go to church anymore? Right? What has stopped you from going to church? What is the reason you stepped out of church? And the number two reason that people gave, over 60%, said it was related to money. Right? No specifics, just related to money. But I can't help but think the reason we struggle with this is because we don't fully understand the impact that generosity has on our faith that it actually has on our hearts. And even bigger than that, that it has on the ability for other people in our city to experience grace and endless second chances. And so to start this series today, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna tell you up front what we're going to talk about over the next few Sundays and why we're doing this series. And then I'm gonna spend some time giving you like a 30,000 foot view of collective's finances. And then we're gonna get into the practical application for today. I hope you're cool with that. If you're not, I'm still gonna do it anyways, okay? So just nod with me and give me the thumbs up and we're gonna keep moving. So let's talk about this series. Over the next few weeks, here's what we're gonna talk about. Here's what we're gonna break down. We're gonna talk about the topic of tithing. The word tithe comes from the Hebrew word for tenth. This is the baseline of generosity in the Bible. God tells us that we are to give the first tenth, not just the tenth, the first tenth of what we receive to him. And God teaches that the way that we do that is through the local church. And so we're going to dig into that. We're going to talk about how Scripture teaches us that generosity is about equal sacrifice, but not equal giving. That faithfulness in giving has nothing to do with the amount and everything to do with our trust in God. And we're going to talk about stewardship, how God has given us a gift and how that impacts our faith and how some of you are stuck in your faith. And giving is probably the reason why. And in the last week of this series, I'm actually going to spend 30 minutes trying to convince you not to give, Okay? And so for those of you who are looking for your out, 
That'll be the last week of the series, and I'll give you an out, and you can take it if you want. And the number one goal of this series is for everyone here who calls themselves a follower of Jesus, which is really important, to grow in their giving. It's to take a step forward in generosity. And what that means for some people is it means it's to start giving. It's to start tithing and start trusting God. For some people who've grown comfortable in their giving, right? It was a stretch five years ago. It was a stretch 10 years ago. It's time to start seeking more of that discomfort. It's start, time to start trusting God a little bit more and seeing what he's already done previously, seeing him do it again today. And for some people, it's gonna be stop giving when they feel like it, right? When emotions pull on them, when you all think I do a good job, and you're like, oh crap, I gotta tip this guy. That's not how it works, okay? <laughs> That's not how it works, right? So it's, it's building generosity as a consistent part of our lives, not, not taking it away when we're going on vacation, right? Not taking it away when we got a house to buy, so we gotta move some money around, but creating a discipline of generosity. Along with this series, we are launching a five-week pop-up collective called Money Matters. This will be led by CT and Rachel Thompson, who have been doing this stuff for the past five years at Collective. They have helped a ton of people at Collective take control of their finances. They have helped people create budgets and maintain them. They have helped people gain the tools and discipline to pay off hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. They have helped people figure out how to take the steps they need to create a future, right? That's retirement, that's savings account, all those things. And here's the thing, and the reason why we're doing this is because I know there are people that go to this church that want to be generous. And I know there are people that want to trust God with their finances, but they have put themselves in a situation that they can't get out of. This is what you need to sign up for, right? So learn and listen over the next four weeks, but join this group, okay? Take time to lean in and dig in and to walk with other people who are walking the same path that you are. Take time to sit with CT and Rachel so they can help you with those things, right? And so this group exists to help you gain financial control, Right, to gain a future, to gain an understanding. Right? And so if you're interested in that, if you need that, it's okay. Right? Most of the people in this room struggle with money in some way. It controls us in some way. Right? You aren't going to be the only, there's already people, we didn't even publicize the group. It's already, it already has a ton of people in it. Okay? So if you need this, sign up for it. You can do it through the app. You can do it through Next Steps. We're going to talk about it over the next four weeks so you can get into that place. Let me talk about Collective. One thing, if you've been around for a little while, is you'll notice that we don't talk about money that often. In the past five years, less than 6% of the sermons have been about giving. We actually stopped passing, passing offering baskets in the fall of 2018, pre-COVID. And the reason we did that was because I didn't like the fact that people felt like they were obligated to give. It felt like every single week we were reminding you to do something that should be a habit and a discipline in your own life, whether or not you're a part of this. And so we stop passing offerings. That's not the way giving and generosity works. I preached on this one time last year, one Sunday. And while other pastors were talking about it during the height of the pandemic, I didn't. Uh, in fact, I heard a few sermons about giving during the pandemic. It kind of made me think of this meme a little bit. <laughs> right? This is a little too real, right? It was like that second stimulus hit your bank account, and pastors were like, and we're talking about tithing. <laughs> right? Because that's, that's what it feels like. Right? That, that, that's what it feels like. And so we didn't talk about it during COVID. 52 weeks of being online, we didn't bring it up because we knew that there were struggles and there was pain. And honestly, you weren't in front of me, and so I didn't know how to talk about it. And I also don't want to be that guy. So, so. But I do teach on giving, just not more than I should. And Collective is an incredibly generous church. Now, the amount of giving has gone up every single year for the past five years, and that's not a normal thing for churches, but it is for Collective. Last year, we took up a special offering to expand our collective kids space. We set a modest, maybe naive goal of $75,000, and this church gave $135,000, right? And I know that everyone who gave to the all-in offering knows that it was worth it, but let me just share some more proof of how worth it it was. Uh, right now, our youth collective, which is our middle schoolers and high schoolers, they meet on Wednesday nights. Since opening up that space, it's quadrupled in size quadrupled in size. These are students who get to talk about Jesus every single week in a really good place. Collective kids, we were averaging 60 kids a week. We're now averaging over 90 kids a week. People have been having a lot of babies in this church, but there was more than that. And one of the coolest things um, that I love is last night, we did Parents' Night Out, and 17 families participated in that, dropping off their kids so we can watch them completely free so they can have a date night, right? So they can have a night of self-care, maybe just a night of rest. And so collective, the thing is, you all excel in the generous act of giving. Let, let me share a few more stories 
There's an eighth grader at Collective who gives every single week. He actually set up his recurring giving in sixth grade and hasn't stopped. I have no idea how he has any money. I don't think he works, but he does it, right? I don't even know how he figured out how to give online, but he, he did it. And here's what I know about this eighth grader, right? He's creating a culture and a discipline in his life that will lead to really good things in the future. And his parents are leading him really, really well. The first person to give to our all-in offering, it came from a guy in this church who doesn't even have kids. He gave $1,000. And it's just because he loves this place so much. Another family was in the process of selling their house because work was actually pulling them out of Frederick uh, to a new city. And the week they left, they actually tithed on what they sold their house for. The thing is, their kids will not grow up here. We, we, never, we didn't finish the space before they left. Their kids have never walked the hallways of this space. But before they left, the thing that they told me was that this was for their family. Right? That, that's us. They did that for us. They did that for my kids. I remember one of the first conversations I ever had a, a, about Collective. We were just a few months old, and my wife and I were over uh, sitting in their house, and we're, we're having dinner with this couple, and we're talking about this church, and the husband looked me dead in the eyes, and he said, you will never get a dime from me. <laughs> I was like, that's awkward, but okay. <laughs> the food's nice, you know, <laughs> Right? And, I, and I told him, that's okay. That's okay. Like, that, that's his decision. That's between him and God. But in January of this year, this family's been trusting God for five years and giving every single month. And I know their story. I know their life. And it's come through job loss. It's come through job change. It's come through a recession. Right? And I could keep going about how generous this church is, but we don't really have time for that today. And so we're not doing this series because you all better shape up or else. Right? I'm not a mad dad. It's not any of those things. That's not what this is. What this is, is this is about us being challenged. Right? It's about us being challenged to keep growing in our trust in God and in our generosity. Because that is what we want to do in, as our church. Right? Because God wants us to do more in this city, in our lives, and in this community. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, or you just started coming to Collective in the past few weeks, I'm sure you're wondering what this series can do for you. And so let me just say this, if you're new to Collective, you can tell a lot about a church by the way they talk about money, right? By how they talk about money, whether there's transparency in their conversations about money, ultimately whether or not the church practices what they preach, right? A lot of you have tensions around this because you've been at churches that don't talk about it the right way. It's really less about giving and more about how it's discussed and the lack of honesty and openness and transparency in the topic. And so if you are new, this series is going to be really good for you to see what Collective is all about as a church and as a community, and I'm excited for you to be a part of this. And here's the deal. You all can see uh, what God is doing in this church. Uh, we have broken our attendance record five times in the last three months. We actually just ordered more chairs for the auditorium because we are filling this place up every single Sunday. Side note. Can y'all scooch in a little bit on Sundays to open up more seats for us, right? All right, yeah. That's our connections team, okay? Right, but, but the thing is, we're filling up these seats. And so next week, you don't have to do it right now, next week. Don't leave two seats in between you and next person, right? Scoot in a little bit. Give us more room because we need more room because more and more people are coming to this church every single Sunday. The thing is, you know God is moving in this church, right? We know that these two walls are gonna have to come down at some point so we add more room to collective, Right? You see that and you feel that on Sunday mornings. It's probably going to happen sooner than what we expect. But let me peel back the curtain a little bit more on collective. So I still, by choice, fundraise part of my salary. It's something I've been doing for seven years, and I'm going to keep doing it. And the reason why I do that is so that we can do more ministry. Right? It gives us the opportunity to make a bigger impact. Every dollar that I fundraise from my friends or my family means we get to spend more money making an impact in Frederick. Collective was financially self-supporting by March of 2019. We were two years old at that point. It's, it's a huge deal on church planning. Most churches make it to year three and die by year five, all because they're not self-supporting. We were self-supporting uh, about two and a half years in. In the fall of 2019, we'd outgrown West Frederick Middle School, and we did a capital campaign to get us into a 24-7 space. The goal was $250,000. This church gave over $400,000 in 18 months during COVID. We have no debt as a church, right? This whole space you see right here, that expansion, no debt. 
We didn't have to take out any loans or anything to do it. It's all been on the generosity of this church over the past five years. Collective's annual budget is set by myself and our overseers. We have a finance team that's a separate team. They meet regularly to keep us on track. These are people who are really smart when it comes to their money, and they help us be really smart when it comes to our money. And this is really important, right? Hear, hear me when I say this. If you end up leaving Collective because you don't like that we talked about money, the next church you head to, you need to ask this question, right? Ask them right away. And if a pastor doesn't answer it, don't stay at that church, Okay. Ask them right away. Ask them what percentage of their budget is spent on staff and facilities. If you want to know where a church is going to end up in a few years, ask that question. What percentage of their budget is spent on staff and facilities? And ask them if they're making their budget, right? The two questions that you get to ask any pastor. You have the right to ask that question. Because healthy churches have facilities and staff under a 70% threshold. In fact, most good companies won't give churches loans if they're over that. Bad companies will, and bad companies do exist when it comes to churches. Churches that are trending toward death or talk about giving way too often have a facility and staff breakdown that's over 80%. And this is true for any church. This is national across the board. And so at Collective, we always stay under 70%, always. And what that means is then we give away 10% to local organizations and to church planning and everything else we get to spend on ministry and fun and impact and growing God's impact in this church. We set our budget, this is another thing, we set our budget based on giving, right? We don't set it based on theory or my feelings. It's based on facts and stats and data. And we've always finished as a church in the positive. And so here's why I say all this, and I want you guys to know this. This is a really healthy church when it comes to its finances. It is transparent and there's a ton of integrity. And my hope is that you feel that, right? My hope is that what you're seeing in this church, this makes more sense now. Last year, uh, I read a story about a pastor from New York who was robbed at gunpoint during his church service. Any of you hear this story? It was live streamed, okay? You can actually Google it and watch him get robbed. It's funny. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. It's not funny, but just wait a second, okay? He was robbed at gunpoint. Pastor Lamar Miller Whitehead was robbed of over $1 million in jewelry, Yep, he was wearing a million dollars in chains and watches. And of course, what happens when that happens? It gets the news, and social media went nuts about it. Christians and non-Christians were posting things like, this is why I don't trust the church with my money. This is why I don't give, right? And I get that. Anytime a really big church abuses money, we hear about it. It's national news, and it should be, honestly. It's the pastor who bought a jet so he doesn't have to fly coach. It's the Christian writer who bought his own books with church money so he could become a bestseller. It's the Christian leader who used their PPP. That's the real story. Uh, it's the Christian leader who used their PPP to buy a house. Right? I've read those headlines. And when I read those headlines, I feel sick about them too. Now, if you start seeing me preach at a million dollars in gold chains and watches, you should probably be skeptical, okay? If you ever see me wearing a watch, something's gone wrong. It's probably monitoring my heart, so. But I, but I need you to hear this. This is really important, okay? If you don't feel comfortable giving out collective, if you don't feel like we are good stewards of our money, if you don't feel like you can trust God with your giving because of this place, You need to leave this church and find a church where you feel safe giving. I don't care. I don't care what other churches and other pastors have done. I'm not leading those churches. God didn't ask me to be in charge of those churches, and Collective is not those churches. Do Do you see where I'm going with this? Scripture teaches us, if we follow Jesus, to trust God with our money. And if the church you are a part of hinders you from doing that, not the church you read about online, not the church you used to go to, but the church you are a part of. If it hinders you from being generous, you need to find a new church. You have to, because giving isn't about me and it's not really about collective. It is about our faith. It is about our relationship with God. It's about our trust in him. And really it's about our hearts. One last thing, and we're gonna get into the teaching for today. If you ever have any questions about the way collective handles money, just ask me. Okay? I know a lot of you are holding on to things from your past, right? And you brought them here, and that's okay. We understand that. But just have a conversation with me. I will always be completely honest and transparent with you about our giving and our generosity. I'll never be anything other than that, okay? So as you wrestle in this series, 
If I don't answer your questions, I'm gonna do my best, but if I don't hit everything, just come talk to me, okay? I'm in the lobby. I'm super awkward and uncomfortable, but it's okay. It's not a bed and breakfast, all right? <laughs> We're not eating together. All right, let's get into the teaching for today. So this series is called I Heart because of something that Jesus said in Matthew 6. This comes in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. This is a sermon that Jesus preached to a massive crowd as he tried to teach all of these people a better way to live. And really what he's doing is he's kind of like resetting God's teaching and God, God's way in his life and what God has called them to. And in Matthew 6, right in the middle, he says this, starting in verse 19. He says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy them and thieves do not break in and steal. And so Jesus says that there's kind of two ways that we as people get to approach money. We can store it up here on earth. We can do everything we can to get more and more and more. We can try to find our security in money, our peace in money, our status in money, our purpose in money, meaning we can make this very temporary thing the most important thing in our lives, even though we know it's temporary, right? even though we know when we die it doesn't come with us. Right? That's option one. Or option two is that we could realize that our security comes from God. And our peace comes from God and our status comes from God and our purpose comes from God. And we can see money as a resource and a tool to invest in the things of heaven. And so here's the first thing to write down today from what Jesus taught. For those of you who have already written, I hate Michael in your notebook, just move a little bit off to the side. <laughs> write this down, okay? This is really important. Money is a spiritual thing. Right? Money is a spiritual thing. A full 10% of the verses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the biographies of Jesus, are about money. 10% of what he taught us. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus shared address money and possessions. There are 2,300 verses in the Bible on money, but only 500 on prayer. Money is a spiritual thing. And we know this is true because money has an impact on us. Right? Money is a thing to us. It's, it's not neutral. It can never be neutral. Think about it. What is it about money, we're talking about money, that can tie us up in knots? What is it about money that makes us think if we just had enough, we would be safe and happy and everything would be okay? But really, it's never enough. What is it about money that can come between some of the closest relationships that we have? Right, think about marriages. Right, for those of you who are married, you know Money is not a neutral subject in your marriage. You have a lot of tension probably in your marriage because of money. It's been that way forever. It's not a neutral subject when your friend promises to venue and never gets around to it. Money is a spiritual thing. That's why it messes us up so much. And if we're being honest when we think about it, we've all been let down by money at some point in your life. Right? Money is the reason why you took that job that you don't like. Money is the reason you said yes to dating that person or even marrying that person and not marrying that other person. Money is the reason why you left that church. It's because it's a spiritual matter with a spiritual impact. One of the books I'm reading right now is called Core 52 by Mark Moore. It's one of the best books I've ever read on scripture. And here's what he wrote about this. He said, money is typically viewed as secular and not sacred. We have church, prayer, scripture in one category, money, bills, and mortgage in another. But that's not God's perspective. Whether we recognize it or not, how we manage money affects our spiritual progress. It can hinder or accelerate prayer. It can replace or promote worship. It can drive us toward or away from the church. It can blind us to God's word or open windows to his wisdom. From God's perspective, our money is an eternal resource. Right, though you can't take it with you, Mark Moore says, you can send it on ahead. Right, it's the idea you get to make a future impact because of it. And because of this, we need to treat our finances as kingdom building because money is a spiritual thing. Then Jesus continues by saying this in verse 21. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Many people think that our money follows our hearts. Right, the idea that we invest in the things that we care about. And while this is sometimes true, it's always true that our heart follows our money. Right? And I know some of you are going to disagree and you're going to think, no, I, I do it the opposite. But this isn't my idea. Right? This is Jesus' idea. He's smarter than we are. He's smarter than I am. 
The way we manage money reveals whether our heart is for the temporary things of this world or the things of heaven. And so here's the second thing to write down. Giving is a matter of the heart. Right? Money has this way of just messing with our hearts. And Jesus knows that we give our heart away based on where we give our money. He knows that what we value is based on where we spend. And so what Jesus does is in the middle of this sermon, he tries to tell us there is a better way to live. And really, there's a better way for us to approach this thing that messes us up so much. And so if giving is a matter of the heart, what we need to do, and this is the, the big takeaway for today, the takeaway isn't to give, but it's to wrestle. And what we need to do is we need to do a heart check. Right? We've got to wrestle with this. And we have to ask ourselves, where is my heart? Right? Where is my heart? Where do I say my heart is? Right? That's a really important one. And where do I want my heart to be? Right? And that, that's really the challenge for this week, is for you to take that time to wrestle with these questions. Right? And in light of the answers, we have to ask ourselves, what does my money say about this? Because wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your hearts will also be. And so do you say that your heart is for lost and broken people? Do you say that your heart is for healthy marriages and healthy families, for healthy men? Men who are willing to deal with their shame and insecurities and step into who God has created them to be. Do you say your heart is for those things? Do you say your heart is for feeding hungry kids and people in our city? Do you say that your heart is for kids growing up rooted in the good news of Jesus and finding their purpose and identity in him and not in the things of this world that are slowly wrecking our kids and our own mental, emotional, and spiritual health? Do you say that your heart is for people having space a community where they can be real and vulnerable about their lives and the highs and lows and ultimately what God is doing through them? Right? Do you say that your heart is for healing and hope and restoration? Right? Because Jesus says, if our treasure or our money isn't in those places, then our heart actually isn't there. I mentioned earlier that money is the number two reason why people in Frederick don't go to church. Do you know what number one is? Is that people in this place, in our, in our community, our neighbors, think that Christians are hypocrites. And honestly, I don't know if there's anything more hypocritical than Christians who say their heart is for the things of God, for grace and forgiveness and for redemption, but their money goes to Netflix instead of the kingdom of heaven. And I know this stings, okay? I know this stings a little, but the reason why is because money is spiritual. It's because it's not a neutral thing. That's the reason why that hits us right in our core. And it doesn't matter where we say our heart is because so much of our heart is tied to our money. Where is my heart? Where do I say it is? Where do I want it to be? Now, while we're in high challenge mode and I've made all of you uncomfortable, I'm just gonna push this a little bit further, okay? A few weeks ago, we did a series called Habits that was about some of the core spiritual disciplines that we need to build into our lives. Giving is one of those disciplines. Giving is one of those habits. These are the things that you don't need to go home and pray about to see if God wants you to do them because the answer is always yes. God always wants you to be praying. God always wants you to be worshiping. God always wants you to be serving. Right? A lot of Christians don't like to hear this, but if you're a part of a church, you're a part of a body. And if you're choosing not to lean in and serve, it's not that you are exempt from being part of the body. What that means is it's like you're a hand that doesn't want to pick things up and you hurt the body. Right? That is the reality of Christians being a part of a church. Giving is the same way. And so being as direct as I can, this series isn't about you going home and asking God, God, should I honor you with my money? Because the answer is yes. The reason why we're doing this series is about us figuring out where we want our hearts to be and aligning our money with that. Because the thing is, you don't need to ask God what to do to change where your heart is. Right? He tells us. He tells us that our heart follows our money. And so if your heart is not where you want it to be, you don't have to go home and pray to God for an answer because it's right here. Right? It's Matthew 6, he tells us. And let me be very clear. God does not need our money. God is not up in heaven trying to manage through an economic downturn because of a pandemic. 
right? There's no pandemic in heaven right now, right? God's not up in heaven trying to get people on both sides of a political perspective to pass an infrastructure bill to stop inflation. He doesn't care about the housing market up in heaven. The streets of heaven are just fine. They're still paved with gold, okay? He does not need our money. So this isn't about God trying to take something from us. It's that God understands that something's going on in our hearts and he wants something for us. And really the reason why he wants us to understand this is because God wants us to be like him. He wants us to move, or move us to being closer to him. He wants to, us to live in the blessing that comes from being a giver. Because God's not after your money, he's after your heart. And God so desperately wants your heart that he sent his son to live on this earth a perfect life and to give it up for us. Right? Generosity is in, in the root of who Jesus is. John 3, 16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible says, for this is how God loved the world, he gave. Right? He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. 1 Timothy 2 says, there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Galatians 1, 4 says, Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. And so Christ gave his life. He purchased our freedom so that we could experience something better. And because of that, I, as a person, I want to be a generous person. I want to be a godly person. I want to trust Jesus as my leader and my Savior with everything in my life. And I think that's what you want as well. Right? And I know that for some of you, the last thing on your mind right now is money because your life is falling apart. Your marriage is falling apart. Your family is falling apart. But that's why you need Jesus. Right? It's about what God offered to you. The most generous gift ever given was when Jesus chose to go to the cross for us to be crucified so that every person who believes in him could have their sins forgiven and they could experience this better life that he has to offer. Right? And so for some of you, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus, ignore the money stuff. Right? Listen to the collective stuff. Learn who this church is. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, what you need to know more than anything else is generosity is a culture that God started when he sent his son to die for us, for free. Right? We don't have to do anything to earn it. We don't have to check any boxes. We just have to put our faith and trust him. And so if you are in that place, lean into that. Right? And the way that you do that, the way we encourage you to do that weekly is to check the baptism box. Right? And what we do is we'll call you this week, we'll talk about what does it mean to match up our actions and our heart to make Jesus our Lord and Savior. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time uh, with church planters that are just a few months away from launching. And from time to time, I get uh, the chance to be a part of these boot camps and these trainings and these assessments. And most of the time, I am asked to share the story of Collective. It's one of my favorite things to do. And every time I get to do that, I don't share about a church. Right? I share about you. I share about the people who've started following Jesus in this church. I share about the people who have broken addictions in this church. I share about marriages that have been healed in this church, faith that's been restored in this church, peace, hope, and healing that have been found in this church. I share about the things that are only possible through Jesus, the things that Jesus came to die for, the things of heaven, the thing that Jesus' heart is for, and the things he wants our hearts to be for as well. Where our money is, that is where our heart will also be. So as we move into this series, as we keep going through this series, we need to keep asking and keep wrestling with the three questions. I have to ask myself, where is my heart? Where do I say my heart is? And where do I want my heart to be? Let's pray. God, uh, we're so uncomfortable when it comes to money. And God, we we don't like this topic. We don't like to feel the way we feel um, when we think about this, when we hear about this, when a pastor talks about it. Um, God, there's just so much discomfort But God, I pray that we recognize the reason why this discomfort exists is because money is a spiritual thing. And God, when we approach it as a worldly thing, as an earthly thing, as a temporary thing, God, when we approach it as something that's equal to you and its ability to give safety and security and hope, 
God, it messes us up. And to be honest, most of us, if not all of us, are messed up in some way when it comes to our faith and money and you and church and pastors and all of it. And so God, I pray over the next few weeks, this is kind of a series that cleanses us of that, that frees us of that bondage and that baggage, um, that gives us peace. God, ultimately, um, God, that this is a faith series that leads us closer to you and our hearts closer to the things that you want um, for this city and this church, for our families and for our friends. Um, God, I pray over the next few weeks that we're so uncomfortable that we have to lean in. God, that we're so uncomfortable that we have to talk about it, that we're so uncomfortable that we have to wrestle with it. Because um, God, we know that it's coming from you and there's safety in that, and there's security in that, and there's peace in that. God, thank you for this resource. Thank you for this gift. God, help us figure out how to use it in a way that expands beyond the earthly things and into the heavenly things. God, we thank you and love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.